Every new day is a precious gift to you. No matter how rich you are, how famous you are, or how intelligent, no matter the advancement in our technology, we don't have the power to make a day begin or come to an end. Each new dawn is a beautiful reminder of God's majestic power displayed in creation. That when one day comes to an end, a brand new day begins. Every new morning is a free extension of your life on earth. A message from God to you that you still matter in His plan here. A message from God that you are still needed here. No one creates the day. No one has that power except God. And oh, what thanks should fill our hearts each morning that God chooses to wake you up each day free of charge and that you get to feel the beautiful sun on your skin, feel the wind, meet with your loved ones, live your best life, win your battles, try again where you initially failed. Indeed, Every new morning must be filled with thanksgiving and rejoicing. The psalmist writes in Psalms 113, 2-3, Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let your heart be filled with gratitude as you open your beautiful eyes to the dawn of each new day. It is a gift, God's present to you. On this beautiful new day, I want you to be reminded of this beautiful message. Never begin your day apart from God. You can get so carried away by tasks, distractions, deadlines, or some responsibilities here or there, and forget to seek God's face. This is the reason behind some of the frustrations of our day. This is the reason behind some missed opportunities. Maybe you didn't know this before, but not understanding God's will for you in a day may cost you more than you know. Sometimes we get ourselves into battles we have no business with. Why? Because we did not understand the assignment. We let our heads drive us. We let our goals drive us. We let our needs our pressures, our desires to get stuff push us. Then we get stuck in things we were never meant to have any business with in the first place. Joel Osteen once said, although God is a merciful God who saves and is willing to save us when we fall into trouble each time we call on him, yet he is not obligated to save us from battles we weren't supposed to have any business with. But oh, the joy and blessedness of the soul that begins their day seeking the Lord. Psalms 27, 8. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Jesus is our perfect example, and he didn't fail to show us what this means. His life is the product of one who always sought God every morning. Jesus never started his day without meeting with God first. The Bible says that early in the morning, Jesus would go out into a solitary place to pray. He would get God's plan for his day and receive God's empowerment for what lies ahead. No wonder he would go through his day winning, defeating whatever rose against him. Sicknesses cast out with few words without swear. Arguments silenced without stress so much demonstration of power and wisdom. Why? He had met the Creator and been empowered for it. Likewise, at the start of each new day, every morning, seek God's direction. Let the face of the Creator of each day be the first thing you seek before you face any day that He gives you. You may be smart. Maybe you have goals you want to hit. Maybe you have a blueprint you've carved out for yourself a routine to follow to reach your goals. These things may be good, but sometimes we make a mistake by charting the course of our lives by a formula we've created, then by the direction of God. Proverbs 3, 5-6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. 
Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't face each day like you've got it figured out because you don't. Living your life by formula is not the ideal with God. Living by faith in Him is. This means having your eyes fixed on Him for every step you intend to take. Faith is looking to Jesus, depending on Him for your very existence. Somebody says, why did God give me a mind, logical thinking, and the ability to plan if I'm just going to dump my life back on Him? Listen, dear friend, although God gave you a mind, without God, your mind, your logic, will never be His purpose to pass, both in your life and in your spirit. Imagine yourself with no knowledge or skill in construction, but in possession of all the bricks needed to build a skyscraper, the mortar, the idea, and the land, but not a single skilled builder at your disposal. You have the idea, you have the strength, and you have the picture of the building. You have the land on which to build it. However, without a builder, none of them would serve their purpose in your life. You can build only what your basic knowledge affords you. But only a master builder would know how to take your idea and turn it into whatever you deserve. Leaving all your resources in the hands of the builder to complete the structure is not being irresponsible or being unfruitful. It means trusting his skill to serve your need. It's still your home. It's your idea. It's your project. But you can't make it work without him. For you to live in it and fulfill your intentions for that project, you have to do your job, which is to employ his services and give him what he needs to make that work. And then let him do his job. Psalms 127.1 says boldly, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. Unless you build on God, the day will not be fruitful the way God intended for it to be. Unless you let God direct your day, you will not arrive where He wants you to be, according to His blueprint for your life. You are weak. God is not. You're limited. God isn't. You have no idea what lies ahead of you regardless of your plans. Yet God knows. He knows what's waiting for you at the office. He knows what's waiting for you in traffic. He knows about the things that will happen at your office, school, or business that day. He wants to show you. He wants to guide you. He wants to deliver you ahead. It's by seeking God's direction every morning that He opens your eyes to see what to believe Him for. You see, sometimes you don't know how to believe God for His perfect will for you. Why? Because you haven't spent enough time with Him to begin to see those things through His eyes. And listen, when there's nothing to believe for, there's nothing to expect from Him. How can you blame Him for something you never asked for? Something you never sought from Him? How can you wait for something you're not expecting? As you open your eyes to the beautiful new dawn, turn to him and say, Sweet Father, thank you for the gift of this day. You're my shepherd and I'm your sheep. I may have my own plans for today or not, yet I lay it all bare before you. What would you have me do today? Where would you have me be? How would you want me to go about this or that? Ask for direction. Ask for direction. When you talk to God like this, you're not giving Him orders. You're instead seeking His will, His grace, His blessings. Some people go to God with orders. They go to inform Him of what they've made up their minds about. They go to tell Him what they want, rather than seeking what He wants. They take the place of the shepherd when they're only but sheep. Psalms 100, 3. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Submit your own plans and ask God which He would want you to do or not do today. Once David had the opportunity to retaliate against an attack on his family by the Philistines, he had the skill, the men, and the resources, yet he didn't. Instead, he went to God and he asked, Lord, should I go after them? 
If I do, will I win? Or will I be defeated? He acknowledged God. He submitted to God. He was willing to stand where God said to stand. To wait when God said wait. And to act when God said to act. God told him, go pursue them, overtake them. You will overcome them and recover what you lost. David did that and he overcame his enemies. There's no doubt you've been praying when you wake up. But do you go to God on your knees and narrate your plans for the day before God like some secretary, then get up and out of his presence? Or do you seek him like your entire success depends on him? Because honestly, it does. You'll struggle without him. You'll keep failing if those ventures don't have his blessings. It's time to return to the feet of your maker. It's time to come back to the sheepfold and wait for the shepherd. It's time to turn from the busyness of the world like everyone and then face the creator. He's got your life under control. You don't have to fear what's ahead of you. Seek God's direction regarding your job today, your relationships, your opportunities, your education, everything, and see how things will turn out. If you realize that God's in control, you will reaffirm your commitment to believe that His plans are for your good and that you're not going to fret even when things aren't going your way. God is your greatest advantage. With Him on your side, success is guaranteed. You've been destined to win today. Start it with the help of the one who knows how to cross the finish line. The opportunity to see a new day is a gift that no amount of money can ever buy you. The rich with all their wealth cannot purchase days for themselves. No one has that kind of power except God. I want you to know that it is not your alarm clock, the cock crowing outside, the person who tapped you, or your own ability that wakes you up each morning. You wake up because God wakes you up. No matter how deep your sleep, how wonderful or terrible a dream you might be having, how tired your body, when it is time to wake up, you open your eyes. I need you to know that this is not your working, it is the working of God. Not because He owes you that, but because of His mercies. Your yesterday may have been filled with so many sorrows and disappointments. You may have committed so many sins yesterday and messed up so much. Yet you wake up to see a brand new day each morning as long as God wants. You see, our Father in heaven does not show us this kind of mercy because we are good enough for anything, but because of His mercies on us. So many good people, healthy people, kind-hearted and productive or ambitious people may go to bed but not wake up from their sleep in the morning. These people should have even more reasons than you to welcome a new day. Yet they aren't here right now. Not because they are bad people or they sinned against God. It's not that God loves them less than you or anything like that. The answer is this. God chooses to show you mercy. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. No one knows what tomorrow looks like. The Bible does not even tell us that tomorrow is guaranteed. Though God promises long life and good things for the future, yet the sovereignty of it lies only in His hands and not in our plans. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. You see, Every new day is the tomorrow you planned about yesterday, yet many of us take it for granted when we do see it. The purpose of sharing these with you is so that you might learn the value of each day and consider every morning a blessing. The Bible says that God's great love is the reason we are not consumed because His compassions never fail. Every morning you wake up to meet a new grace, a new mercy, a new favor, another opportunity to be better, to win, to change for good, to grow, and become who God wants you to be. Therefore, 
Regardless of how your yesterday or entire life has been, look at each new day through the lenses of gratitude. Look at each morning as God presenting you with a brand new gift called today, with a smile on his face and love in his heart, despite knowing you for who you are. Many times we look at the things we have or don't have yet, and we allow them to hinder our thanks. But look, my friend, your true gratitude shouldn't be only about what you have in your life or don't have yet. If you take out the time to analyze your life, you may find out that you have more than you are grateful to God for. Some of the things you may lack right now and think would make you more grateful if only God gave them to you is actually God showing, doing you a favor. Why? Because through the limitations of our minds as humans, think we need some things in our lives, not knowing that those things have the potential to destroy us or even those around us. However, God in his mercy and omniscience, understanding this, keeps us from having some of those things to save us from their effect. If only our eyes were open to see some of these things, we would know that we must thank God for literally everything going on in our lives every time. David wrote in Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 through 5, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. My friend, whether things are going great or not for you, as a child of God alive today, alive in Christ, you have every reason to start your day thanking God. Don't start your day complaining. Don't start your day looking at your deadlines. Don't start your day looking at yesterday's losses and failures. Don't start your day looking at those who are for you and those who are against you. Instead, start your day looking to God in gratitude. Look to your heavenly Father. Those who do will come out radiant. And instead of shame, you'll be surrounded with confidence because you have soaked yourself up in the love of your Father, the monarch of the world universe who's got everything in his hands. Maybe you don't know exactly what to thank God for at the start of a new day. Let me help you. Here are a few things to thank God for. Number one, his unfailing mercies over you. David wrote in the Psalms, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. As I already impressed on you, each new day is a display of God's mercy enduring over our life. Start your day Thank God for showing you his mercies and blessing you with another brand new day along with every opportunity associated with it. Number two, his patience with you. Through the blessing of each new day, God gives you another opportunity to be better, to come to him, to embrace his love. Second Peter chapter three, verse 15 says, remember that we are saved because our Lord is patient our dear brother Paul told you the same thing when he wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Many of us keep pushing God away. Some even curse God. Some postpone their repentance because of one reason or another. Yet I want you to know this. With each new day, God is displaying his love and patience with you. Not to encourage you to keep doing what you have been doing, but instead to have another chance to do what's right. To have another chance to come to him another day to save your soul, to protect and deliver you. It's like the father of the prodigal son waiting earnestly for the sun to show up on the horizon every day without giving up. If God could close the page on you, you'd be lost forever, but he hasn't yet. Instead, you have another day to come to him. Isn't that worth thanking God for? Number three, the gift of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ. If there is one thing to be constantly thankful to God for every morning is the blessed hope of glory and eternal life that you have in Jesus Christ. Not only does this guarantee your eternal future, it secures your today. Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 says, 
and you will joyfully give thanks to the Father who has made you able to have a share in all that He has prepared for His people in the kingdom of light. God has freed us from the power of darkness, and He brought us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Through your life in Christ Jesus, you have access to God and to the inheritance of every saint in God's family. Through eternal life and salvation, you have an advantage over the rest of the world, God on your side. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. God decided to let his people know this rich and glorious secret which he has for all people. This secret is Christ himself who is in you. He is our only hope for glory. Thank God for forgiving you each time you turn to him for forgiveness and for loving you like you never sinned before. Thank God that you can come to him as an accepted son or daughter. Thank him that you can ask him for anything and he will do it according to his will so much that you will be fine. And lastly, it is worth thanking God for some of the trivial things that you might actually be overlooking in your life. How about thanking God for the air you breathe, the sunlight on your skin, your eyes, and every other organ in your body? How about thanking God for food, for clothes, good drinking water, and good health? How about thanking God for your child or children, for your spouse, your sibling, the salvation of each of them, or the fact that you still have them today? The list is endless, my friend. If you look at all of these things, you will discover that you shouldn't step out of your bed without giving thanks to God. He deserves it every day. Today, you can make a change and ask God to help you stay grateful for all that He is and all that He does for you each day. Let us pray and give thanks to God together. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that it is a good thing to give you thanks all the time, especially at the start of my day. Today, I choose to make this commitment and to start by thanking you. Regardless of what may or may not be happening in my life right now, I won't deny the fact that you have been good to me. Thank you for your endless mercies over me. Thank you for placing your attention on me. I can never fully comprehend why you care for me or love me the way you do, Lord. But I am grateful. Forgive me for taking your love for granted before now. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for helping me to see the light that is in Christ and to embrace that life. Thank you for helping me to put my faith in Jesus and to receive the eternal life that you give to all who receive him. Father, everyone who looks to you finds strength, hope, and light. I am thankful because you've got my back at all times. Therefore, I will not fear the devil, this world, or everything in it. Instead, I will start my journey and make my way through life thanking you because you are my Father, you love me, and you always have everything under control. Take all my praise today, dear God, for the food, the water, the air, the health, and for my loved ones. Everything that is in your hand is fine. So in confidence, I thank you because we are all in your hands. Continue to glorify your name in our lives, Father, and I commit that as long as I breathe, I will forever be thankful to you, for you are my source, my Father, my God. Amen. When the Lord considers our needs, He never overlooks even the tiniest detail since His reputation is on the line. God has already handled the most difficult problems we will ever encounter far before we ever realize there is an issue. God had already planted a tree that would sweeten the springs of Mara ages before Moses would find them. God had previously directed ravens to meet Elijah with food long before he felt the consequences of the drought. God has already sent a lamb to bear our guilt and humiliation before we were conceived in our mother's wombs or would ever commit a sin. We aren't ever intended to reach a place where God has not previously been, no matter how many ups and downs life can have. He has already sorted out that need even before it comes to your attention. His timing can never be like yours or mine. It is perfect. It is magnificent. When He sets out to bless you, nothing can stand in His way. So don't worry, saying, What will we eat? or What will we drink? 
or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Jesus spoke these words precisely for you and me to help you overcome whatever need is making you anxious today. This is one of Christ's most magnificent promises. All your needs will be supplied for us if you pursue the kingdom of God. God wants you to be free of material concerns so that you may focus on spiritual matters. In today's society, a Gentile is someone who does not know or worship God and instead seeks after the things of this world. Everything in our world that is material is slipping away. Sadly, we frequently use the majority of our energy in pursuit of material money and belongings. When you feel yourself drifting into a worldly attitude, you should repent, turn around, and begin pursuing the things of God's kingdom all over again. God will bless you when you make such a decision. God will never withhold, withdraw, or forfeit anything that is required for our life. The morning sun and evening moonlight are as dependable as God's providence. And what about those cloudy and rainy days, you might wonder? The sun and moon may not be seen, but it does not imply that they are not shining. You should take that check to the bank when God says, the check is in the mail, my friend. Your admission letter to the Dream Ivy League University is in the mail. Your doctor's call concerning your diagnosis, which you have been dreading, will arrive with wonderful news. You've been healed. In Jesus' name, God has heard your cries and will supply that need that has been troubling you. Our faith is easily frustrated in this world of designer clothes and fancy vehicles if God does not lavishly provide for us. God frequently gives us the greatest when he gives us the least, which may surprise us. Although Peter only found one penny in the mouth of the fish, it was sufficient to pay both his and Jesus' taxes. Even though a little boy only had five loaves and two fishes, Jesus used them to feed thousands of people. That is where God's provision is hidden. We receive God's welcoming heart when we take from his extended hand. And once God sends himself to us, we discover that we always have more than enough. As you beg God for more, approach him with thanksgiving. Take a listen to what King David had to say about God's providence in Psalm 37, 25 through 29. I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The psalmist is not implying that if we serve God, we will never suffer difficulties. He is poetically stating that if we trust God and obey his plan, he will take care of us and satisfy our needs. God is our safe haven in storms and our refuge when the waves of life surge around us. Because God is faithful, we may trust Him now, tomorrow, and every day. Trusting in God is a joyful experience. It is because of His fidelity that we are able to rest at night. Because we know He has already defeated the adversary, Satan, the assurance He gives us permits us to rejoice in the midst of suffering and have peace in our hearts. You may be tempted to envy, or worse still, deny God's goodness when you observe how evil people flourish. This psalm reminds us that we should not judge others based on their looks. Worthless people's riches will be fleeting, but believers' steadfastness will be rewarded. When you observe the seeming victory of the evil, you should not be restless, irritable, or quickly irritated. Those who practice patience and trust rather than those who obtain their selfish aims by wrongdoing, will enjoy lasting success. Don't be tempted to take shortcuts because you don't believe God will supply. 
God will ensure that those who choose spiritual values above financial wealth will be materially benefited in due time. Believe in God's promise to fulfill your heart's wishes. But my God will abundantly supply all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 The Lord graciously enters into our prayers to translate any incorrect aspirations that may be in our hearts, and He intercedes on our behalf so that our petitions are translated into divinely delivered benefits that will be for our benefit and the greater glory of God. He accomplishes this by giving all we need rather than what we believe we desire. So many of the things we require are life's immediate demands, which are limited to this ephemeral planet and the finite time and space span that runs from birth to death. God anticipates your every need before you ask. He understands what is best for you. He knows what is better for you. He has your best interests at heart. He does not compete with you. He is bigger than that. He wants to bring out the best in you. He loves you today, tomorrow, and the day after that, and forever. God promises that He will meet all your needs entirely. Many times, we believe we know what we need, but when we finally obtain it, we are unsatisfied. If you allow God to meet your wants, He promises we will be completely fulfilled. The God of the universe who made us and understands us better than anyone else will provide us with everything we require. God promises that your needs will be met according to His riches. Are God's resources limitless? Nope. God will meet every one of your wants in full according to His riches. God has the potential to provide anything we require. Because He loves you, He is willing to do so. Not only will God supply to the full every single one of our needs for those who are in Christ, but He will do it for His glory. My God will satisfy all your needs through Christ Jesus, according to His riches in glory. We must constantly keep in mind the distinction between our wants and our needs. A need is something that is definitely necessary, something that you and I must have in order to exist. We all require food and water, as well as shelter, clothes, and transportation. They are very necessary and unavoidable. They are required for our survival. A want is something I'd like to have, something I would hope or crave for, something I find appealing, but it's not something I have to have. I can live without having all of my wants met, but I must have all my needs met. God's bank will never run out of money. He has plenty of resources. He has an endless supply of them. This was shown via Jesus' miracles. God gives by drawing from His vast and limitless resources. Because He is the creator of everything, His wealth stems from His status as the genuine God of the universe, indicating that God's riches must transcend the total wealth of the cosmos. Pray that God would open your heart. Christ, who has everything, likewise gave up everything. Christ became God-man, then died in our place, a criminal's death, and suffered all of God's wrath for your crimes while on the cross. Christ became lowly in order for you to become wealthy. You must surrender your life to Him and repent of your sins. Our God is certainly a kind Father who loves and protects His children. You are His child. You are His responsibility. He will meet all your needs. He will hold your hand when you cross the road. He will protect you in your daily commute. He will give you His favor when you meet your supervisors. He does not want you to worry about anything. God loves you. You are His child no matter how old you are. God knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knows each and every need that worries you. Paul can't help but break into prayer in verse 20 because God's gracious offering is so marvelous. Now and forever, glory be to our God and Father. Amen. Philippians 4.20 When God's people are giving, Paul argues that praise to God is the proper response to the one who satisfies all needs. All good and perfect gifts come from our great provider, 
our Father in heaven. May we never turn our desires become requirements. Instead, may we conduct our lives on this planet with the knowledge that life is short and that our everlasting home is in heaven. May we be satisfied with whatever we have and offer God praise and honor for His constant and bountiful provision. May we likewise delight in the fact that we are children of our great and generous God, and may we be ready and prepared to honor Him with all our belongings and resources. And may we become joyful donors for the sake of the gospel, knowing that we are honoring the Lord, who will never fail to provide what we need. What is the whole sum of life? What is the greatest testimony of a life? Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes and the wisest man before Christ, wrote the answer to this in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. The whole duty of man, he said, is to fear God and keep his words. In other words, a life pleasing to God must be the ultimate pursuit of every man. You see, this is the major purpose of God's creation. Every single purpose that you believe God created anything to fulfill is aimed at this one thing, to please him. So when the eagle dives in on a prey and captures it for food, it is pleasing to God. When the wind blows and the rains descend, they serve a purpose. Nothing is out of order. Yes, there are natural disasters which may or may not be attributed to our man-made activities on the planet. Encroachment, deforestation, global warming, and a host of others. However, the existence of God's creation is to give him pleasure, to please him. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Take note of that eternal fact, that God's will brought everything into being and the existence of everything according to how he willed it to be gives him ultimate pleasure. When God looks at you, he looks upon a creature whose very existence is an opportunity to please God. Sadly, our world today has forgotten who God is. They refuse to acknowledge the existence of his creation, and they debunk any idea of living a life that pleases him. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they had penalties for their sin. The first part being spiritual death, a separation from God. In separation from God's abiding spirit, a new form took up root. Because you see, there can't be a vacuum. It must be filled. Either God fills it or something else does. And in Adam and Eve's case, the sin nature entered. They received the nature of sin which was transferred down the human race. Every living person became subject to sin, the devil, and finally, to eternal death, eternal separation from God. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way came to all people, because all sinned, and as long as any person remains there, no matter how hard they try, they can never please God. That's why the increasing number of prison or prison sentences hasn't stopped crime from rising. Harsh sentences or punishments for wrong hardly discourages most people from crimes. You may tell yourself that you won't be doing anything wrong today, and before you know it, you're back where you started. And even if you find the most moral of men Without the life of Christ in him or her, they still fall short of God's justice system and is deserving of condemnation. 
The Bible says that our righteousness are like filthy rags before Him. However, when you and I made the decision to put our faith in Jesus Christ, God brought us from under the verdict of death and made us sons and daughters in His holy family. Not only so, in this new position, we can easily please Him. Romans 8, 20 to 21. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. As a child of God, dear saint, now you have what it takes to please God. You should live a life that pleases God. It is what proves that you have indeed encountered the saving grace of Jesus and have the Spirit of God inside you. What does it mean to live a life that pleases God? It's making that conscious decision every day to put God first in all you do. It's waking up each day and bringing all your needs, your ambitions, and your pursuits before God. It's letting God have the final say over what comes in or goes out of your life. In simple words, living a life that pleases God begins when you make up your mind to surrender to Him every day. From the day you received Jesus into your life, you gave God permission to preside over your life. And when God takes over a life like that, He changes everything. He doesn't fix the old, He changes it. God doesn't come into a chronic smoker and try to offer recovery therapy. He doesn't come into the life of a drug addict, a murderer, thief, or liar, and then try to refurbish them. Dear child of God, a washed used car is still a used car. You could change a lot of parts, but it is still what it is. Change the seats and put a new car smell in there. It's still a used car because someone has still once used it before. You wouldn't compare its value to those of a brand new version of that car. Likewise, the same issue may apply to someone who honestly wants to please God or be acceptable in God's family without being born again by putting his or her faith in Jesus Christ. You see, without faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot have eternal life. And without this life, you cannot receive the ability to please God no matter how hard you try. John 1, 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So, dear friend, God does not refurbish people. He changes people. He picks up a messed up life like yours and mine and gives us his own life instead. This is the reason why people said old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things don't become new because of some physical working of man. They become new because of the inner working of the Spirit of God. God takes a helpless sinner who cannot help his or herself against disobedience, crime, and all of it. And he turns that into you a holy saint who loves and fears God, wants to obey and please Him, and is not scared to let God lead while they follow. My friend, this is not the working of some psychologist or a therapist. It is the transforming power of God from old to brand new. Yet this video was made to edify your mind and witness to your spirit that you are God's child and that you can do what will make Him proud of you. This video was made with you in mind that if there ever was anyone who could live a life pleasing to God, that is you. Why? Because you are a child of God, no longer with the nature of sin, nor a slave of it, but with the nature of God. And although this transformation will not reveal itself overnight, it's a steady process, one with a list of endless possibilities in a future that's full of hope, especially in the life that's to come when you leave this world. The manifestation of this divine transformation will only be possible through your surrender to the Holy Spirit of God every day. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Maybe you're asking, what is the relationship between faith and surrender and being able to please God? You see, faith is taking hold of everything you know about yourself and about your situation and submitting the authority of that knowledge under the authority of what God says it is. We could say that faith is submission. It's submitting my fears to God and choosing not to give in to fear because He told me so and I believe Him. It's submitting my lusts to Him and expecting to carry out my daily activities without the tension that comes from battling lusts in my mind all day long. It's believing that God says I am dead to sin and that regardless of what I feel right now, sin has no control over me. Romans 6, 6 6-7 For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Therefore, can you live a life that pleases God? Is it possible to be holy? The answer is yes. Yes, you, the person listening to my voice right now, can please God. Yes, you, no matter how many times you think you've failed God, can live a holy life. Don't forget, dear friend, that the righteousness we get by receiving the life of God in us is a gift. It's not the product of our working, but the gift of God given through Jesus Christ. So when we got it, it became an anchor for all the righteousness that would proceed through us by the things we demonstrate now that we are saved. Through God's gift of righteousness, we are sanctified vessels. Therefore, since you've received the gift of acceptance before God through faith, you can live in it also through the same faith. Only this time, this faith is called submission. Now when you pray, when you read your Bible, and when you decide to practice what it says, it comes from a place of love for God and a willing submission to live for Him than for yourself. When you wake up in the morning, you must understand that it is another day for you to go out there and be God's man. It's another opportunity for you to continue being the person that God intended for you to be the best way you can. Therefore, to fulfill that desire of God for you, you have to yield yourself to Him. Hand Him the reins of your life. God cannot strengthen what He can't use. He won't give you the strength and grace to go please your fleshly cravings and all. Instead, the Bible tells us that God gives His grace only to the humble and those with a broken spirit that trembles at His word. Are you a believer, but you still struggle to live a life that pleases God? Stop struggling. Start trusting. Stop trying to make yourself stop. Start submitting to the very things you've been trying to suppress all by yourself before God and trust Him. When you wake up every morning, say, Father, help me to surrender to you today. Give me the grace to do your will and the strength to obey you, no matter what you may ask me to do. That is a prayer of a person who wants to live a life that pleases God. Talk to God like that. Then, submit yourself to Him to take the lead every day. Emotions are as powerful in effect as we allow them to. Entire lives of families, communities, and even nations have been affected by actions of individuals driven by emotions. Man is a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. The soul, the seat of your emotions, was given to you by God for the purpose of connecting what you see and how you feel to a response. Anger, empathy, fondness, pain, passions, comfort or discomfort, desperation, excitement, and many more are elements of your emotions. They say so much about you as a person. Imagine a person without emotions, no empathy, no love, no passion, no pain, no excitement, their hearts beating for nothing, 
They are neither up nor down. No anger, no fear, no grief, no nothing. You don't want to associate with such a person. You feel they are dead because of this. When you are afraid or vulnerable, that's an emotion. When you grieve over a loss, that's an emotion. When you feel despair as a result of uncertainty, that's emotion. Emotion is not a bad thing in itself. When you are passionate about something, that's emotion as well. When you empathize with someone, that's emotion too. When you feel confidence, that's emotion. You just bought a puppy and you're gushing over it with fondness. That's emotion. You listen, watch or remember something funny, and you laugh, that's emotion. You feel the need to keep going without giving up, that's emotion. Emotions are a language of our subconscious mind transmitted to us to initiate defining actions in a moment. Your strengths and your weaknesses manifest themselves in the emotions that you transmit from the signals you receive. Although you are a spirit, the signals from your spirit can sometimes work with the signals from your subconscious self, your soul, your emotion. It could be God, it could be the devil, people, or just you putting yourself in that spot. This is why your emotions are not so much the kind of things you want to build your life on. It is why you must learn about your emotions and how to control it. Because you see, your emotions are like waves. Today they may be up, and tomorrow they may be down. You might have met people who switch between modes or self. It wears you out being around them, doesn't it? However, this discourse is about you. So let us focus on you right now. The Bible says something about focusing and pursuing your life's course to the fullest. Philippians 3 verse 14 through 15. I press onward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Everyone who is mature should take such a view of things. Did you see that? Are you mature? What view is that? I need you to really listen because it gets interesting now. You see, you can control your emotions by knowing who you are, by knowing what you are. You are the person in the driver's seat. You are the one who is in charge. You call the shots here. You were not made for your emotions. Your emotions were made for you. Emotions are suggestions submitted to you through your mind. You, the real you, are the one who chooses what response to give. If you let your emotions take the driver's seat, there will be chaos. There will be conflict. Have you ever had conflicting emotions before? That situation where you wanted one more thing but felt something else. That situation in which every part of you was screaming aloud and you just didn't know what to do with yourself. You were stuck between giving in and giving up. That you just stood there like you weren't even alive. Do you realize that those emotions manifested along with your inability to arrive at a conclusion? You didn't know what you had to do at that time, and you were an embodiment of conflicting thoughts and responses. If you knew what you had to do, you'd know to silence every other thought and the emotion that accompanies them, and you'd stand on the choices you've made. Your flesh, your body does not always enjoy change, nor the adjustments that come with it. And guess what? It will suggest lots of emotions to you in a bid to persuade you to accept whatever it wants. Pressing, like the Apostle Paul wrote, 
is not a sweet experience when you start it. It requires effort. It requires work. And boy, does our bodies hate work. Yet you see, that is what it was made for. That's what you were made for. You were created for the great things, not to settle for the less. Remember, we are still focusing on you right now. Do you remember when you wanted to quit? Why was that? What happened? Was it the pain? Was it the pressure? Look at it this way. Everything you faced, the challenges, the pressure, the pain, they were never meant to break you. Instead, they were meant to break your limitations. What are your limitations? Your weaknesses, your sentiments, your comfort zone, your wishful thinking. All these are your limitations. We were all raised to believe that challenges and pains are negatives, but that is not entirely true. Tough stuff go through intense pressure to be the way they are. Look at your precious pearls, for instance. Gold goes through fire for its true beauty to be better appreciated. While it is still in its raw state, it is still gold, isn't it? All of its beauty is still in there. All its features still intact, but hidden underneath the dirt and its raw state. In that raw state, you could walk past that gold and not truly appreciate it or even recognize it. However, when that raw material goes through intense heat, it is purged of all its impurities. And the next time you find it, it will be a totally different material. No longer that raw and dirty looking material, but a fine, glowing treasure. You are gold, my friend, a rare treasure put here on earth by God. The Bible says God has embodied his treasure in vessel made from the earth. This vessel is your body. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Where did God put these treasures? In you. That's right, you are an embodiment of God's great treasures. Maybe no one has told you that before. Maybe you don't even feel like it right now. Maybe you don't understand your own self just yet, but that is who you are. Yet those treasures are in their raw state. And in order to prove that they were put there by God, they have to be unlocked. And how has God prepared to unlock them? Through intense situations. Look at bodybuilders. Their bodies may resist those trainings from the beginning, but keep pressing on nonetheless. They don't let it get to them at all. They bear the hardness, the pains, the heavy weights. And then one day, when you look at them, you see an entirely different person. Yet, it is not a different person. It is the same person who deliberately shut down whatever yearning of their bodies and become someone better, someone stronger, and someone faster through intense training. Just like that bodybuilder or athletic champion, you have the faster person inside of you you have that stronger person inside of you. What separates who you are right now from that person is the training you are willing to subject yourself to. Similarly, challenges are the training of our personality. It brings out the fighter in us. During exercises, some people usually confuse their body's resistance for its inability to go on. But that is just a false interpretation. That is your subconscious self sending you the information of your body's adjustment. Your emotions may present that to you as pain and despair, but it isn't. 
you have to know the difference and hang in there. The gold does not jump out of the fire because it is hot. Instead, it takes the heat and goes through till the end. It trusts the refiner. It trusts the process. It knows that with each heat, the refiner does not take its eyes off it. With each heat, one impurity is removed. With more heat, more impurities are manifested and removed. It keeps telling itself, just a little while longer. One more, one more, one more, and this will all be over. Once I go through this, which is all, I am never going back to who I used to be. I will be a better element. I will be sought after. My value will increase. You want your value to increase? Control your emotions. You want to be sought after? Control your emotions. You want to change? Take control of your emotions. You must have control. You must have control. Inability to control your emotions, control yourself, will threaten your rising in life and destiny. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Your emotions will limit you. You have to silence that voice of defeat. You fell down, that's fine. Deal with it. Get up, dust yourself up, and try again. Silence that voice of hate and despair. Were you hurt? and now you feel disappointed, deal with it. Life happens to everyone. Get up and try again. Your failures, your pains, your disappointments do not exist to make you back down. They are compliments. Hear me, they are compliments. They came to prove the champion in you. Don't lock yourself in the room and cower in fear. Don't shut down and cry your eyes out. Don't throw in the towel just yet. There is no room for fear. There is no room for despair. There is no room for quitting. There is no room for any such limiting emotions right now. Make a choice today. Do you want to win? How badly do you want it? Then rise up. Get yourself together. Summon the mighty man or woman in you. You are brave. You are not a coward. You are not weak. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yours is not a spirit of fear. You are not weak. Yes, you are human and have the right to be vulnerable, but you are not weak. You are strong. You have control. You are supposed to. Therefore, take it. Take control. Yours is a spirit of love. Yours is a spirit of power. Yours is a spirit of a sound mind. Embrace the real you and take the driver's seat. Do not let your emotions rule you anymore. It is time to be better.